and you have seven million dollars of investor money sitting in there. I wasn't. I, I I literally moved out to the property for a month and a half. Moved from San Diego to Texas to work with the on-site management to make sure they got their ass in gear, and we threaded that baby across the finish line because I was not letting that thing go. I said, yeah. "There's no way in hell." I said, "The only thing keeping this thing from getting to the finish line is effort." All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the report today. We are in the studio here in downtown San Diego, and I got a special guest who I've actually connected with uh, through our Beers and Deals meetup here in San Diego. And uh, I'm super intrigued by this individual. He owns over $100 million of apartments and mobile home parks. I got my man, Justin Brennan. Justin, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to have you on the show. Um, I don't know a ton about your your story, so I'm actually super excited to dive into it. But man, you're right up the street. You said Scripps Ranch, huh? Scripps Ranch, La Jolla, anywhere coastal San Diego. So we're we're both local. And yeah. you were telling me you're San Clemente, so we're all S Southern California boys. Yeah, San Clemente is where I grew up. That's why I love San Diego. I'm like, you know, I'm an hour from home where my family is, but it's like not too far, not too close, you know? So question, do you surf? Uh, okay, so San Clemente, uh, growing up there, you either grow up surfing or you grow up skateboarding. Uh -huh. And for whatever reason, it was never both. But I like grew up hanging out with the skateboarders and I grew up skateboarding. So skate parks. Skate parks. Um, we, we would build like skate ramps and rails and all sorts of stuff like on our cul-de-sac as a kid growing up. And then I got into snowboarding uh, at a later age. But uh, a lot of those skills kind of transition over. Uh, that's cool. You're, you're a surfer. Uh, I'm not. I was going to okay. ask you because we're both Southern California people. And, gotcha. Um, I had, I mean, I, I have a shark story with surfing, so that's why I don't surf. But it mm. was here in, actually in San Diego what probably happened? 20 years ago. I was out in Pacific Beach right near the pier around 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I was with two other buddies. We were sitting there waiting for the next set to come in. And the, like, the sun was just perfect, right, where it's hitting the water. And we're waiting for the next set. And next thing you know, about a 15-foot shadow Whoa. goes right underneath all of our boards. And we all sit there looking at each other. We all knew what it was. Like nobody had to really say like, because we knew it wasn't a seal and it sure as heck wasn't a dolphin. Mm. And we like all put our hands up and we were, we were longboarding, throwing those babies around. Nice slow paddle right back into shore. I mean, I, I, I was, I mean, it was, it messed me up clearly, mm. but I've like call it whomping, right. Or bodyboarded. And yeah, I love, I, I kite board now. So I love kite boarding. Oh, oh, so how, how common is the, the shark thing when you're out here surfing in Southern California? You know, they're out there. Yeah. That's what I hear. I, mean, I have friends that surf. I mean, obviously the odds are completely in your favor, but it's it's all unfortunately in my cabeza now. Dude, so. I can imagine. I would be creeped out too, man. I don't like sharks. <laughs> uh, but the kite surfing, that's yeah. that's unique and that's, that's something legit. that I've, I've been always wanting to, uh, to get into. I know how to sail. Um, I have a background in sailing. And so, you know, if you combine sailing and surfing or, you know, with my skateboarding background, snowboarding background as well, I feel like it would be kind of a natural progression for me. So I've always wanted to do it. I'm always intrigued watching these guys on YouTube. You would YouTube. love it. Tell, tell me where you go. So I started learning in Fiesta Island, okay. San Diego, during COVID. I'm like, I gonna need to pick something new up. Yeah, that's <laughs> so the perfect time to go. learn. Got taught, trained, and yeah, it's wild because I grew up wakeboarding. And if you picture it, it's you're essentially driving a boat and surfing at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. So the hardest part is learning the kite. But with your background in sailing, you understand wind, right? Up, sure. up wind, down wind, like these patterns of wind. So you'd probably pick up on it a lot faster because you got to learn to fly that kite. And once you figure that out, then it's, you know, rest is... How much wind uh, do you need ideally? Because I know the, the air here in San Diego is very light compared yep. to other parts of the world. But there's a lot of days where the, the wind never even hits six knots. Right. So what's the ideal wind here, minimum? 12 to 20 knots is okay. kind of where you, you when I have a little app, like the wind app that shows you where all the wind's at and where mm -hmm. it's hitting. And then you're going to use a 14 to 18 meter kite. So it's a little bit bigger kite than if you were in some higher wind areas like Hawaii. Gotcha. So, so I see these dudes out in like South Africa where it's like, it's yeah. gusting 45 every day. They're using a tiny what, kite. Well, how big is that kite? It's six to eight meters. Wow, that's maybe. crazy. Like m mini kites, because I mean, they're launching. Yeah. yeah. So uh, dude, I'm, I'm super intrigued with, with your story here. But uh, first I got to ask you, man, like what is the biggest difference between mobile home park investing and, and multifamily? Well, with mobile home parks, obviously you're dealing with a different profile, right? Because it's different affordability and stuff like that. You know, the, the kind of the rule of thumb with any mobile home parks is you want 100 pads or more. You want them within five miles of a Walmart. You want them in a town of at least 100,000 population or within distance of a population of 100,000 or more because you need that demand supply. 
Um, whereas with you know multifamily, I feel like as long as you're in good job centers and you're in the top 75 MSAs in the United States, um, you'll be able to, to, to do well. Um, but I'd say the dip, the biggest difference is just your tenant profile. Well, and, and the fact that I guess, you know, with mobile home parks, you own the land, you're basically a land Lord, literally, and you're renting, you know, the mobile home to the person or they, you know, they buy it from you and they own it. So they're just renting the space. Ideally, do you want to, uh, own the homes on the park no. as well, or, or do you want to just, uh, have the, the tenants own? Just, those? I just want to own the land. Yeah. It's like an RV why, park. Why is with, that? Um, because you don't want that liability with the mobile home. Uh, okay. You might as well, th- you know, let them own it. Plus eviction purposes and all that other things, you know, they can, they can control that liability. You just want to be, you know, basically land lease in a way on the mobile home parks, much more efficient that way. And I can imagine property. your expense ratio, uh, much lower goes way down if, if you're operating that way. Yeah. Cause you're keeping everything pretty, pretty lean. No repair maintenance, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause they basically, you're renting a pad, yeah. a land lease. And I know they're not building a ton of new supply with mobile home parks. Are there any areas to where they're building more? Not so much building them as much as it is. There's a ton of them out there uh, in different areas. A vast majority are still mom and pop. Did you know that one of the largest owners of mobile homes in the United States is Mr. Warren Buffett? No, I did not know that. He owns 21st Century Mortgage too, which actually produces all the financing for the mobile Mm. home parks in the United States. So I heard that Warren Buffett uh, has some part ownership in a company that manufactured the actual homes. Mm-hmm. But you're saying he he owns a, a he, ton of mobile he, home back, parks back, as well. Yeah, through funds and stuff. Yep. I the mobile homes, you sense. said, the mortgages, the financing for them through 21st uh, century financing. Yep. Um, but then he also has access to the mobile home parks. Yep. I guess it makes sense. I mean, if you're manufacturing a lot of these homes, you probably have inside scoop on a lot of these deals as oh. well. Big time. Yeah. I mean, all around the country. I mean, you, you can imagine Mr. Warren Buffett. I mean, you know, he's got all the people, you know, working for him, but that guy is the, the quintessential investor, isn't he? Yeah. Everyone knows him as like the quote unquote, like stock guy, right? Yeah. Um, Wall Street guy. But um, no one really talks about him owning real estate. A th- and a ton of it too, but it's, it's quiet, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't talk about it because he's kind of the guy that goes in and, you know, operates companies, right? Or has a piece of those companies and helps them, you know, take it to the moon. Yeah. So what kind of like uh, mobile home parks do you guys target? And then typically, what does the, the business plan look like from a macro perspective? So like I said, 100, 100 pads or more. That's so you get the volume and the economies of scale. Um, you want all the utilities uh, kind of controlled on site to where, you know, c- city, like city, city utilities mainly. And you're a land, you're a, a, a owner of the land. So you're leasing the pad back to the, to the tenant. And that's your main focus. And then you look at other parameters for population growth within Walmart. It's kind of like a, a funny joke, but if you know, if a Walmart's within five miles of your mobile home park, you're, you're pretty good mm. for weird reasons. You and and what, what are the reasons behind that? I, it's commercial based and it's job centers. Cause you know that if you have a Walmart, right. And then usually the population, cause Walmart has enormous amounts of data, right? Mm-hmm. So when they're doing all their research for how they're going to put a Walmart into a town, they know all the parameters. So that's kind of your tenant profile. People that shop at Walmart. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> what, so what, what's like, uh, you know, I, I know like median household income in, in the U.S. is um, kind of in that, that 65K range. Mm-hmm. What is ideally in the, these mobile home park areas, what kind of median household income are we talking? About 45,000 okay. on average. You know, even for the, the apartment stuff, depending on the market, you know, north of 55,000, you know, median household would start to, you know, classify a decent apartment market. Mm-hmm. So, Dude, I love that, man. Um, so what do you guys own today? Kind of give me like a snapshot of, of what you guys own. And then I, I do have a ton of questions about the multifamily side, but, uh, what do you guys own today? About 500, 520 units, give or take in five different States, about 110 million plus in assets total. But we started with one condo, man. Really? <laughs> Damn. 2010 financial crisis, uh, Murrieta, California. We bought one condo, hundred thousand dollars, put a you know, twenty five thousand dollars down, got a seventy five thousand dollar loan from Wells Fargo, turned that into a duplex, then a triplex, and a couple fourplexes all around San Diego. And then from there we got into that five to ten unit space, quote unquote commercial. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, gosh, like we need to scale, but we can't really do that locally because San Diego is pretty expensive. So we need to scale our money out of state. Well, that brings a whole another set of logistics. How do you manage it? How do you 
you know, logistics, operations, construction, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a decent amount of time from really 2018 all the way till now setting up infrastructure in states like Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, Arizona, Nevada. And so now we have assets in those states because we went in and, you know, three to six months in advance of buying any properties, we're setting up PM crews, construction crews, brokers, all kind of the infrastructure, the team on the ground mm -hmm. to where that way it feels super comfortable when we know that we know the play. We know the good areas, the bad areas, where's the, the path of progress, where's the new development. Now, when you, you just mentioned all these states, did you go in and, and identify multiple markets within those states to set up these teams? Or did you just pick one market and say, this is the one market such as Phoenix, Arizona? Oh, gotcha. Uh, within the state. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So Kansas City, Missouri was okay. a great one. And I had no idea. I was actually at a conference. Do you know who Dave Lindell is? Yeah. He, so he, he wrote does like one Ari of my, Mentor and all that stuff. What, two of my favorite books. Um, one of them is uh, Emerging Real Estate Markets. Yeah. And the other one is uh, Multifamily Millions. Yeah. Multifamily Millions is great because it kind of teaches you like, it's like a good intro book to like commercial real estate and all those principles apply to all asset classes. It's not just multifamily, but like the idea of buying a underperforming, tired commercial deal improving it, renovating it from the, the, yeah, the outside, value add. From the outside right. in and uh, forcing your equity that way. But those same principles apply to the hotel stuff that we mm -hmm. do and uh, emerging real estate markets. I mean, that's great just to kind of understand like, you know, what moves pricing in different real estate markets across the country. But uh, anyway, so, so Dave Lindahl, you were connecting with? Yeah, I went out to a conference in 2018 in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and okay. met, you know, there's thousands of people out there, met a bunch of people, connected, tried to identify markets that we were interested in, ran into a couple of different brokers, and one, this guy said, hey, man, you need to come see Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm like, Kansas City? He's like, just trust me, come to Kansas City. And I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to fly out there in January, negative whatever degrees, snowing. I think that's when the the Chiefs were playing the Patriots in one of like the AFC championship did you, games. Did you go? Uh, I'm a huge Patriots fan. Okay. I did not get a chance to go to the game, but I get to watch the Patriots win. Dude, <laughs> so I, I was happy with that. I, I've gone to one game at Arrowhead before. Uh, I'm a Charger fan. Okay. Um, but I went went to a game there. It was the same thing. One at a time, it was cold as heck. Uh, the fans are like, you, they stand on these styrofoam like boxes on top of the concrete and it kind of oh, keeps your feet warm. Oh, interesting. But uh, dude, nicest fan base I've ever seen. Like literally, uh, they stand up the entire game. Yep. Like even during timeouts, they don't sit down. Great fan base, but and super loud. But after the game, the Chargers won on like a last minute drive. Like they won by one point. And it, it was like late in December, had playoff implications. And literally every fan on the way out was like, thank you so much for coming. Congratulations on your dude, win. That's the Midwest spirit. Yeah, it was Thursday night football. So, you know, they do the yeah. set down on the field. Mm -hmm. So we were all walking down to do the post game set uh, to go watch it. And all the fans were coming up. Oh, so wow. they're all passing us in like a sea of red. And they were like, congratulations. Thanks for visiting our town. And I was like, met, I've never if met. If you were in like Pittsburgh or Philly or. <laughs> yeah. They'd be you know, there was giving four of you us the, all the bird the whole time. Yeah, four of us in our Charger gear. And they, I've cow. never met such a, a friendly fan base. Uh, but anyways, we digressed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you you were saying Kansas City show up January. Yeah, and I was blown away. So Kansas City reminded me when I saw it of San Diego downtown, okay. early 2000s when the ballpark was going up. Mm. Cranes everywhere, everywhere. So I'm like, holy cow. And then I get the lay of the land from the brokers. We're seeing where everything's at, path of progress, growth, development, blah, blah, blah. And he said, hey, here's kind of the areas you want to be. Here's where you don't, blah, blah. And we ended, in, ended up, our first out-of-state deal was a 27 unit and then 31 unit. Those have been phenomenal for us. And then started going into, you know, Texas, uh, started looking in Nashville, Tennessee, and Knoxville. Uh, and now we're in Las Vegas and Nevada with Rudy Medina. And then obviously I love the Phoenix market now that it's coming back to earth. Um, but Arizona's a great market. So what's the biggest asset that you guys own? 160 units in Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay. It's a brand new construction class A that just completed. And we're now we're moving it out of construction financing into permanent financing. Gotcha. And so that's that's a challenge. And was that a new development for you guys, mm -hmm. or you guys bought it after the ground it was up? Built? Yeah, ground, ground up, up dirt. Nice. So Rudy and his crew built that uh, from ground up, and now we're bringing in new capital to replace the construction capital, and going to refinance it into permanent debt. So, mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's wild times in the capital markets, man. As yeah, you, as you know. How long does it typically take to lease up? Um, you know, 160 unit building like that. Uh, you know, 12 to 18, I mean, 
call it, it depends on time of year, right? But mm-hmm. you know, summer months, you're going to be doing, you know, 10 to 15 leases a month mm-hmm. if you're moving. So you figure something like that and then you slow down in the slow seasons like right now. So you figure at least 12, 12 months, Yeah, you know, maybe 18 months total. So it just depends. Yeah, that sounds about right. So you guys are doing, yeah, you're buying a lot of the smaller stuff. Are you guys kind of pivoting your strategy now and in, in getting into larger, larger buildings? If you love real estate investing, passive income, and tax benefits, but don't have the time, my company, Summers Capital, is buying boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even handle all the day-to-day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, visit summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. Yes, because the economy is a scale, and that's kind of what we learned is you know, our first out of state one was a 27 unit and then a 31 unit. And I'm like, I'm looking at going, gosh, you can go get a hundred unit deal and it's easier to raise the money. And there's more people, the banks want to give you the money easier because the economy is a scaler there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ran into that with a a private equity fund group and we were trying to raise some money. And I said, Hey, um, I need, we need $3 million. And they said, Justin, like, we love the deal. We love you, but we can't give you 3 million, but we can give you 10. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I looked at yeah. him and I'm like, so let me get this straight. I only need three, but you're telling me you'll give me 10. Then I'm like, yeah, just go find us a deal. Like we want to invest with you. And that's kind of what triggered my mind. Like, oh my gosh, like we need to get into the bigger space. Cause now you're going to have a complex that's self-contained its own management on site, payroll, leasing, maintenance, everything's self-contained focused on that property and the economies of scale go with it. Yeah, dude, I love that you brought that up. You're exactly right. It's like it's it's almost like getting lending for multifamily and the bigger deals, and, and we see this with the hotels as well. Is easier. Yeah. You know, you go get a a smaller loan amount for a multifamily deal, and you know, deal with a lot of like regional banks, and they're gonna want full underwriting and all this, you know, paperwork. Where you go get a you know Fannie Freddie agency loan for multifamily. Mm-hmm. You know, non-recourse debt. Non-recourse. Um, they're not looking at your debt, personal debt to income ratio. Your right. Uh, they're really just sizing up the deal based on two things, the the experience as as the sponsor. And the DCR. And um, the way the deal pencils. Yep. Yeah. And um, shoot, some of those loans are so, in terms yeah, of we, pricing, we are just, very competitive too. We just threaded the needle mm-hmm. on one of our Texas deals, 121 units. And we had purchased it in December 2021. Hindsight now, peak of the multifamily market. Interest rates, as you all, they started to go rocket ship in March of 2022. Yeah. And so we went from a four and a quarter interest rate on a, a bridge debt financing, right? Because we were going to buy Damn. it. Four and a quarter bridge. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're buying this. Everybody was there. Thankfully, we only had one of these, <laughs> but we bought it. Four and a quarter interest rate and, you know, renovating the property. Business plan's perfect. Everything's going great. And obviously, interest rates go from there to nine and a half percent on us. And so we're now rushing to try and get this thing refinanced, but we need to get renovated to have the rents high enough to then Mm -hmm. have a new valuation to refi. But we just had to do a huge $2 million cash in refi recently Mm. and buy down the debt and get us into a Fannie Mae loan at 5.49%. And we just got extremely lucky, Mm. like so lucky. I can't even tell you because literally a week after we closed on that loan, the 10 year treasury went berserk. And then you can see where it's at today. And so now you have a lot of these multifamily guys. I mean, I'm telling you, man, there is, I mean, when Grant Cardone talks about a storm of brewing, he's looking at the same data I am. It's no joke. I mean, between coming up this year in 2024 through 2025, you have an enormous amount of commercial debt set to reset or need refinancing, coming to maturity, all these things. And it's just a question of who's too big to fail, who can get workouts, who can get extensions mm-hmm. because the refinancing is going to be very tough in this environment right now. Yeah. And, and you know what? It really depends on, on who you talk to. I did just interview uh, Robert Martinez, apartment rock star out in yeah, Houston he, about a month he's ago. He's a buddy of mine too. I love it. And we were talking about he, he just foreclosed on a $51 million multifamily note that he picked up in early 22. And so he was trying to see some of that so stuff. He, when you say he foreclosed on it, meaning he gave it back to the bank or he, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. It was a, it was a Freddie, it was a Freddie floater. Yeah. That he picked up yep. an early 22 A class deal, didn't have a lot of value add component, but he said he switched over from in house property management, which he's been doing mm-hmm. this entire time, to third party right when he bought that deal. And he said they kind of they kind of ran that deal into the ground. And anyways, the lender wasn't working with them, and uh, they ended up taking the property back. Yep. 
So I think there's going to be more of those to come. But, you know, to Grant's point, you're talking about Grant Carnot. I mean, he was on this podcast t- telling me that he he bought a billion dollar multifamily portfolio in Fort Lauderdale in uh, December of 2021, okay. right before the rates went up on on floating rate debt. And oh, he said that, that I'm shocked he did that. He told me that he's he's he has not refied. He would have to bring tremendous cash in to refi right now. But uh, he's told I'm me he's, shocked he's, he he's did just, it. He told me he's just basically from what I gathered. I didn't I didn't really dig in too much, but from what I gathered, he made it pretty clear that he is just uh, basically covering that debt service right now with his mm-hmm. own money. Holy moly! Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually really shocked that he did that um, because he's relatively conservative on his underwriting and puts an enormous amount of equity into deals and typically is class A fixed rate debt guy because of what he went through in 2008 and 2009, which he talks about. He was Mm -hmm. very close to imploding. So I'm shocked that that's the case. But everybody's affected by it right now, which is why I said we got so lucky because if had we not been able to refi and thread that needle on that deal, it's likely going back to the bank. Mm-hmm. You have $7 million of investor money sitting in there. I wasn't, I, I, I literally moved out to the property for a month and a half, moved from San Diego to Texas to work with the on-site management to make sure they got their ass in gear. And we threaded that baby across the finish line. Cause I was not letting that thing go. I said, yeah. there's no way in hell. I said, the only thing keeping this thing from getting to the finish line is effort. Mm-hmm. And I said, what I'm not going to do is allow this thing because the on-site PM company doesn't want to get their head out of there. You know what? I said, I'm going to show them how to manage this baby. So we went in there with their staff. We took it from about 82% occupied to 98.9, delinquency down to 2%, all the work orders under 10, all the future renewals in line. Boom. Got the thing right across the finish line. But that's what it takes. Yeah. I love that you did that. And, and you know, quite frankly, that's what it takes when, when things go south. The loan brokers were pinch. floored. They yeah. were floored. The Walker Dunlap guys, they're like, Justin, we have never seen. <laughs> We've actually used you as a case study because we've never seen an owner literally move on site to one of their assets to safeguard it. Mm. But I said, I said, thankfully it was, we only had this one in this predicament so I could focus. And I said, there was no way in the world I was going to allow $7 million of investor capital to go poof, which a chunk of it's ours. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. What what kind of techniques were you utilizing that worked well? Hyper proactive, aggressive, every day hammering things out. Cause it's four reports. I said, you can manage an entire and Robert Martinez knows this very well because he's a very good operator. You can manage an apartment building if you focus on four reports, okay. the availability list, the work orders, delinquency, and renewal list. If you manage those four reports on any apartment building extremely well, like white on rice, the financials will back it up and that thing will hum. Mm-hmm. But I said, if you don't manage those extremely close, like daily, then you'll start to see it suffer. Because those four reports will tell me where the property's at today and where mm-hmm. it's going to be at 90 days from now. Okay. And if I can come in there and manage those things correctly, and it's it takes intensity, which is what a lot of these PM companies, unfortunately, you know, I don't expect them to care about our money the way we do. I don't expect it, right? So if they're not going to, then I'm going to, <laughs> which is why. I mean, and the PM company got pissed. They didn't like that I was out there. Da, 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 da. But I said, it's not your money. Yeah. I said, quite honestly, you know, if I didn't need your systems, running the back end, you'd be gone. They're on site. How, how big is this property? It's only 121. Okay, only. But, it's, it's 121 units. But you had on site like mm-hmm. what? On site leasing center, um, maintenance. And mm-hmm. then we had a kind of, they called a floating leasing person. Got it. In. Yeah. Yeah. That's good that you guys had on site because you were talking about some of the smaller you, deals you guys did early on, 28 units, 31 units. Those are all off site. Yeah. You telling me this story, it reminds me. So like one of our early deals was 32 unit building Indianapolis. Mm. It had all the problems. It had hookers, prostitution. <laughs> we we showed up for the inspection and the cops were there like arresting some of the tenants. Um, but it was in a, a pretty decent area. Really? And uh, yeah, it was. Okay. It was just this, this property had all the problems. Gotcha. And so we renovated half the units, but... Um, we got into a, a position because, you know, with 32 units, you're not, you don't have on site. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with those smaller buildings, like I think one of the biggest challenges is you're dealing with a lot of, you're not dealing with institutional level property managers. You're right. dealing with a lot of mom and pop managers smaller. that might manage fourplexes and single family homes. Right. And so it's a little bit out of their wheelhouse. And so you're kind of in that, that no man's land where it's mm-hmm. a little bit big for those kind of managers, but it's way too small for the institutional, yep. more professional level managers. 
And so, you know, those properties you got to get hands on and we're out of state. We're like, fuck, you know, occupancy dips down to like the high sixties at one point. Wow. And, uh, we're like, oh my gosh. We yeah. You're hyperventilating. So, um, what we did was we kind of reached a kind of a hybrid agreement with our PM to keep them on, but we said, we're going to handle the leasing. Yep. And so we, uh, put out a job posting for like all the local realtors in the area that live within like a two mile radius Dude, of the you, property. You did what I just did. <laughs> oh, you guys did the same thing? I love it. Yeah. So uh, it. so we did this. We found a, a local realtor, young woman who was kind of a hustler. And she was like, yeah, I'd love to. And we're like, hey, we're just going to put, we're going to pay you a flat rate each time you lease up a new unit for us. Get a commission. And yep. then we went on um, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. Mm -hmm. And we just started slamming ads, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist to lease up our units. And then we would control all the, the leads that would mm -hmm. come in. The flow. And then we would funnel all the leads to her mm -hmm. and she would follow up. She would schedule the appointments. She would do the tours. So did you not have a, a, a PM software that was running kind of that syndication onto all the portals and stuff? Or you did? At this time, we weren't syndicating anything. This okay. was our, we JV'd this no, deal. No, 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 no. I'm meaning in terms of uh, for the... For your available units, was it out to like apartments.com, apartment list, like all the portals? Yes, the property manager was, but, okay. but we would like test them. And this is good for any listeners out there. Like if you have third party PM, like, like send them a lead from yep. like a, you know, a random see, number see the response rate and see what the response rate is. And yep. for them, it'd be like five days before you'd hear back. And it's like, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's uh, when we kind of took it in our own hands, but we got that thing leased up. Yep. We ended up renovating half of the units, 50%. And uh, cap rates compressed. We ended up owning it for two years. We bought it for 1.1, and uh, we exited exactly two years later for 3.1. Good for you. And um, that's a, that's a that's a good two times on that. Yeah, and so three, that was kind of times. my first taste of like operating a, a multifamily deal in that kind of yep. that range right there. Um, but that is that is the management portion for those types of deals that are kind of from 20 to you know, you have to, it's, it's, it's very hard. You have to manage the managers. Yes. And this is what I've learned. And, and quite honestly, look, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter how big or who the PM company is. It can be RPM. It could be asset living. It could be some other ones out there that are the big conglomerates nationwide. It's irrelevant. It's all about the people because they all have systems. They have their PM softwares. They got their payment processors. They have all their systems, all their, it's great. But if you don't have strong people, your community manager, right? Or the person that's offsite managing your property, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't have that person that's strong. And then if they don't have services in house to handle the leasing and the follow up and all that stuff, if you have an offsite manager, you're going to struggle. And that's why it's critically important. And if you're managing out of state, that you you set up the infrastructure in place in yeah. advance, which is what we did in all the markets. We got if we were offsite management, we met with a couple PM companies that were kind of mid-size that did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have the small little guys, but we didn't have the big guys either. Um, but even then, I mean, we just had to do this and I'm still doing it on the Texas deal because I'd been asking for a floating leasing agent for 12 months from this PM company. And they kept giving me, you know, temp agent crap. And I said, guys, I'm going to show you how this is done. You want to see how this is done? Boom. Went to Facebook, went into the real estate groups. San Antonio, Texas. Within seven days, I had an amazing leasing agent on site, moving like what, you know, just humming. Boom, yeah. seven days. I said, it took you guys 12 months. You couldn't get your head out of your ass. Mm. I did it in seven days. That's just effort, guys. It's effort. Yeah. You can't, you don't, I mean, it's unbelievable. And you get, you, so you saved the 7 million of equity. Yep. Um, and you, you mentioned you guys brought 2 million to the table to, to refine so the firm. So five originally, two more. So total Got seven. It. Okay. Correct. And that's because the rates went up pretty Yeah, pretty I mean, get, we had to buy down the debt because, yeah. you know, Fannie Mae was only going to give us 63% loan to value mm. based on financials, based on interest rates, debt coverage ratios, all these things that are important. And because of that, we had to bring a cash in. Now, thankfully, we did not over leverage that property going in the door. We only put 70% debt going in. Mm. Thank goodness. Because had we jacked yeah. it up like a lot of syndicators did, that $2 million would have been four or five. And then most of the investors would have said, we can't, mm -hmm. like, that's crazy. It doesn't make sense anymore. And that's yeah. what you're starting to see happen. So uh, there are amazing opportunities coming that I can tell you, like we just launched our opportunity fund or $25 million opportunity fund. And we're going after this stuff because I know it's, 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 it's starting now through 2024, 2025. So, and it's interesting you say that because we're, we're starting to see deals shake loose on the hotel side. What is the opportunity fund that you guys are launching and, and what kind of assets are you guys targeting? 
Hey guys, real quick, the only way the show grows, the only way we continue to bring on bigger and better guests is if you guys rate, review, and share the show. So if you could take two seconds or the click of the thumb to review on Apple or Spotify, it will mean the world to me. But more importantly, we'll be able to reach more entrepreneurs and more real estate investors and help them build wealth through this podcast. Now back to the show. Multifamily specific, uh, dedicated towards really cash distressed assets where we can come in, pick up an existing product, right? That just needs cash infusion, take it over, and run it right at a new valuation. But we'll probably pick it up direct from the asset managers inside these debt funds. There's about five or seven debt funds, big guys, that a lot of these deals, and they made these kind of riskier bridge debt variable rate deals over the last three to five years. So I'm inside those guys right now, just talking to them saying, hey, if you have loans or deals and problem properties in these regions, we're your people. Because mm -hmm. it's not, you're not gonna, it's not gonna see the light of day. You know, the Black Rocks, the Black Stones, all these guys are gonna gobble up the big stuff you're going to get kind of the low hanging fruit, but decent stuff. And that's how a lot of these kind of distressed deals. And then also construction deals where people have gone in new construction and they're, they can't move it out of the construction financing and they need cash infusion to kind of come in and you can take an ownership of something that needs help. Great asset, maybe great location, but it got caught up in all the interest rate pops. And they went through 11 interest rate hikes, right? Over a, what, nine month window. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's causing a complete S show. And a lot of people are just hanging on for dear life and kicking the can down the road, hoping they can refinance in the future as rates drop. And maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't, but it's a very precarious situation in the commercial space right now. Very. Yeah. We're doing the same thing right now. So one of the deals that we're picking up uh, December 13th is through our one of our bridge lenders, but they're like a big, basically debt fund, they're like a mm -hmm. REIT, but they do bridge lending for all commercial real estate. And so they have, you know, some bad, some stuff that's going bad, right? Yep. And so this particular deal they brought to us and they said, hey, you know, we're taking this one back, but yep. we think you guys would be the perfect operators for it. It lasts appraised for 7.5. We're picking it up for 4.87. Beautiful. And it's two years old and it doesn't require any Beautiful. reno, nothing like that. See, that is, I mean, that and is so like, like music to my ears. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So my guys, like, you know, we're busy right now with a bunch of other stuff that we're doing, but I'm like, guys, we, we have to pick this one up. Yeah. And so- I'm like, let's just be as easy as we can to work with. Let's make this one go smoothly because when they have future stuff go mm -hmm. bad, like I want to I want to be the first to find out about it. So I love that strategy. Well, and, and it works because yeah. the the debt fund we just paid off on that refi, mm -hmm. I won't mention who they are, but they were ecstatic. They were surprised that we actually were able to pull it off and they were ecstatic. And they were like, Justin, like, wow. And then I said, well, it's been two weeks since we paid you off. I just wanted to ask, do you have any other bad loans that are on your books that you may need to have a discussion about? And so mm -hmm. you get into the asset manager and these mm -hmm. are, that's how it's going to get done. It's not going to the brokers. It's kind of not coming on market. This is all going to be belly to belly inside these asset managers. Do, do you think a lot of these bad multifamily deals that are, um, you know, potentially going back to the lender, do you think a lot of these or a good portion of them will actually have some sort of capital injection come in and the initial borrower is not going to have to give the deal up, but they might give up some equity to that that capital partner. I think you're going to have a combination of all the above. And it really depends on what does it look like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning how bad is your debt? How much did you over leverage? What's the valuation? Because cap rates are rising, right? So that's causing a massive challenge in some of these markets. So, you know, what is the property worth? Does it make sense to come in with new equity and stack it? Or does it make sense to wipe everything clean and start fresh? And come in at a different cost basis. Correct. Because yeah. that's really the challenge is the, is the basis mm -hmm. because, you know, every, we all know everything ta 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 because of low cap rates. And now in the short term, everything's dropping in value. Now, if you have good debt and, you, and you're fixed and you can just hold on for dear life, then hold on for dear life. Yeah. Because it's a holding game. Well, it's not a great time to sell. If, you're, if your property is performing get, well, you're going to get murdered. Right. Yeah. So you might, even if you're not, performing that well, but you can ride yeah. through it, ride through it because mm -hmm. it's no different than if somebody came to me in 2008 and nine and said, oh my gosh, I just watched my home value drop 65%. It's never coming back. I'm never going to see my value again. I'm just going to give it back to the bank. Well, if you had, I can understand why you would think that, but now that you've seen it, you know that it's coming back. It came back for all the homeowners mm -hmm. and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back for everything else. It just may take five, six, seven years. You may have to hold that asset where your business plan was three now it's going to be seven, maybe more. 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe more. It'll be interesting to see, though, uh, like what happens next year. We got election year. Yeah. I saw an article come out uh, recently. I, th I think it was Forbes, but don't quote me on, on who put it out. But it said that, you know, they're foreseeing rates to actually drop next year like four times what the market's actually pricing. Yeah. Um, and so they were looking at like, you know, uh, basically early Q1 of next year us to officially enter like a recession yep. and for them to do rate cuts between Q1 next year to the end of the year, somewhere around like two and a quarter, yep. which it's would possible. be very significant. It's possible. I mean, yeah. I, I, it's been so unpredictable, but it's going to come down to economic data. And at the end of the day, it's all about jobs, right? It's all about jobs. Meaning if that job report is strong, they're not dropping rates. If the job report starts to get weak and consumer data starts to go south, they're probably going to drop rates. It's all yep. about the jobs. That is going to dictate where we're going. True. But... I mean, initially they said the rate hikes were because of inflation. Mm -hmm. Now inflation's back down, you know? Yeah. I mean, the data is showing that, but they're still not going to drop the rates until the jobs go with it. Yeah. They're just, they, they can't because, you know, the Fed's dealing with a really interesting situation where inflation or whatever's out there is actually helping them in some ways really mitigate their own debt. But at the same time, if they, they can't raise interest rates anymore because then they're paying, right, debt on their own debt, interest on their own interest and it gets nasty. But, you know, right now they're going to stay right where they're at until they see some sort of economic data that gives them the indication that, hey, we like we need to come save the world again. Yeah. And then rates go. So uh, I'm curious, like as we look out for the next 12 months, let's say end of 2024, I'm not going to hold you to this, but where do you where do you foresee like multifamily cap rates and, and interest rates, generally speaking, uh, December of 24? Uh, they're going to continue to go up. Um, really? All, all of next year. Interest rates too? No, no, no. Interest okay. rates are going to stay right where they're at. Got I it. think we've peaked on that. So cap part. rates will just catch up. I mean, up. unless you have some crazy inflation data, there's, interest rates are staying right where they're at. And if anything, they will drop, but I, I don't think they're going up anymore. I don't think the Fed can. Like they're at that precipice where it's like- Got yeah. it. So you're saying cap rates are just going to catch up to, to e the rates? Correct. Got it. Because you're still having that delta between what sellers want and you know buyers can pay and blah, blah, blah. But it's- it's going to take time for that to filter through. Yeah. Yeah. Because right now, even in, you know, I mean, for even new construction stuff, you're seeing caps at 6% in some markets, six and a half in some markets for class A new construction. And then other markets, if you went into Texas, you may see temporarily cap rates at 7% that were previously at four and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's jumped that much. Now, I'm, I'm not even looking at those right now because... It'll make you go sick to your stomach on how temporary valuations are on some of these buildings. But if you have decent debt on your property and you can hold, you just hold through it and you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, it's funny. There's a, there's a lot of operators that are probably kicking themselves right now because they, they had an opportunity to exit in like 21 or early 22 yeah. for some absurd number. And they're like, ah, we're going to hold a little bit longer. And now they're like, oh, shoot. But we then you also have some operators that literally sold uh, in early 22, right before the rates went up. And, uh, and they're just like, oh, oh my gosh, thank God. Uh, Tyler Devereaux, um, out in Maui, he yeah. was on, he was telling me he's, that. A, he's a good dude. Very good dude. I love Tyler. Yeah. yeah, Tyler's a great dude. Um, doing some big things out there um, in Maui. And I've always been like inspired by him. Like just a good dude to talk to, positive and uh, just growth minded. Yeah. Um, he, he actually invested in our, our boutique hotel fund. Um, but dude, Talk about a great human being, you know? Yeah, he's got a good he, vibe. I, I went to his uh, multifamily mindset out in Vegas yeah, yeah. a couple of years ago. Okay. Got to meet with him and some folks and very sharp, yeah. good human being, good vibe, good energy. He, um, dude, I, I talked to him uh, I talked to him last couple of weeks ago, but he uh, he told me that he, he broke up with his partner. They broke up. Oh, wow. Well. It's crazy, right? Because they have a lot of stuff together. I mean, just wow. on the ownership side, but yeah. also with the, the mindset stuff or the mastermind. So he was, it's funny because like on the podcast, we're having a conversation. He was asking some questions about partnerships and all that. And then talked to him two weeks ago. He's like, yeah, he didn't break up with him, but his partner said, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore. He's like, I'm going to hang it up and uh, call it a day. So obviously Tyler is like, you know, he's he's going to keep this thing going. But uh, sure. so he's going through a lot of like restructuring right now. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Um, how do you? Do you have a morning routine? Like, do you, how do you handle kind of mindset stuff? I'm always curious about how people handle like their daily activities, even meditation yeah. or, you know, the mind game, right? Cause it's so much of what we do every day as entrepreneurs. Dude, I got to be honest with you, man. Like I don't do a ton of, uh, like morning routine stuff. So I'll, I'll tell you what I do. I wake up and. What time do you wake up? Uh, I usually try to wake up at seven. Okay. 
God, you get to sleep in a little bit. Yeah. That's good. I wish I had that. To me, that's not really sleeping in. <laughs> to me, I'd be like, holy cow, it's yeah. noon. Because if I'm, if I'm in bed by 11.30 and yep. I'm up at 7, that's okay. seven and a half hours. That's good. If I'm in bed by 10.30, that's a, that's a really good uh, yeah, night right uh, there. But anyway, so... Yeah, as you wake up, first thing I do um, is I, I go straight to the gym. I don't try to open my phone or anything like that. Um, I'll drive to the gym. I'll get a good workout in, come back, uh, shower, change, and then I'll walk into the office. I'll grab a, a little Starbucks on the way in and come to the office and uh, just jump right into it. We always say, like, you know, you should the, – the most important things of the day you should do first. And so mm -hmm. for me, the most important thing is taking care of my, my body. Yep. And so that's why I try to go out and go and work out first thing in the morning. In the afternoon, if I don't get my workout in the morning and I try to go after, you know, a full day in the office, Are you suffering? I just have so many more excuses not to go. But also like the energy and the vibe is different in the gym at that hour. It's like you go in the morning, like the people in the gym are like they're there because they want to be there. They're mm -hmm. getting after it. And there's a whole different energy. And then you go in the late afternoon or evening. It's like people that are pissed off. Yeah, people are kind of dragging their feet. They're there because they have to be yeah. there, right? And so, um, anyways, that's what I that's what I kind of do. And I jump into it. Uh, I would say like work weeks wise, like Monday we do a ton of meetings. We do our level ten meeting in the morning, um, and I jump into like a lot of one on ones. Um, I do a, a call every Monday afternoon with my business coach, and uh, Tuesdays, um, Tuesdays more meetings and stuff like that. And then we have our mastermind calls for Tuesday, Thursdays, Wednesdays are always content days. So we'll do two podcasts, sometimes three podcasts okay. on Wednesdays. And then Fridays, I just kind of like leave open. I try not okay. to schedule anything on Fridays. And it's just kind of a day for like thinking or uh, whatever I things I, I want to do on Friday, I'll do. So it's Have just you really read depends. that book, um, Atomic Habits? No. By James Clear? I've heard of it. Incredible. Incredible book. Um, I'm about halfway through it right now. Okay. Um, but it talks about, you know, mastering your morning, you master your day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and habit stacking and like these other things that if, if you know you either want to get rid of bad habits or put some good ones in and how do you specifically do that? I mean, I can't even summarize it right now, but I tab all my books, right? So that way, if I have to go back through them to pick up a piece of info, yeah, you know, it wasn't just like I had read an entire book and then I think it's going to stay here. So I actually will tab and highlight areas that I like was curious in, uh, but incredible book. If you, I mean, and so I started doing that habit stacking that's what they call it, meaning I will wake up at 5 a.m. After I wake up at 5 a.m., I will make my bed. After I make my bed, I will do 10 push-ups. After I do 10 push-ups, I will go downstairs and make coffee, right? So you're habit stacking these things in line mm -hmm. with other things you already do. So that way it'll naturally fall versus, I mean, if it was something you didn't like, yeah. then you would, but you needed to do, <laughs> you try and habit stack it mm -hmm. so it'll fall in line with what you're already doing in your normal day. If you actually were to track what you do in the morning mm. and then try and sit something in there. Uh, Cause it takes 67 days to actually instill. Have an habit. A yeah. little habit. Yeah. Well, what does the book say about having a morning routine past making your bed and making a cup of coffee? Well, they say it's incredible. I mean, I, I, so I set my, cause my biggest thing was if, if I have a great morning like set up uh, even before kids wake up and chaos starts and all that stuff, any parents can speak to this. Having that about an hour to maybe an hour and a half if you're lucky, which is why I wake up at 5 a.m., kids wake up at 6.30. I need that hour and a half to kind of get moving, do what I need to do, do a workout, mm. coffee, meditation, listen to affirmations, all these things that need to happen so that way my energy is in the right position to then deal with these little beautiful souls and get mm. them to school and deal with that. And then before the business chaos starts. Because if I'm waking up any later than that, then emails are starting, texts are starting, all that stuff's already blowing up. And I mm -hmm. need that hour to kind of get set before I feel like here comes the world yeah. for me. And, and that's, that's helped tremendously. Yeah, so. that's good. I know everyone has like their their things that they're into. I, I, I tend to side more with like that Alex Hermosi approach. And he, he basically <laughs> says like, he, he likes to just, and he's very extreme, but I, I'm not that extreme, but he just wakes up and, and starts working. He just yeah. jumps right into it and goes, I like to He doesn't, he do, he doesn't have up. kids yet. No, he doesn't have kids That's, yet. I guarantee, yeah, he doesn't have kids I yet. guarantee that changes when he has yeah. children. So he'll like, he'll like get, he says he gets up and literally just starts working yeah. and he'll work, work, work. And then like in sometime middle of the day, he'll go to the gym, take a break and yeah. then come in and work in the afternoon. But I like to wake up and literally I just, instead of opening my phone and all this BS, making coffee and all that. I literally just brush my teeth, 
put my workout clothes and I'm out the door. Yeah. I literally don't, I don't even eat before I go to the gym. I just bring a protein shake with me and some water, so some you know, electrolytes and that's it. Yeah. You know what I had to do to stop looking at my phone? One of the first or two things that people do when they wake up, right? They, yeah. Right, is this goes to the, the atomic habits book is you want to attach something that you typically do. That's not good for you, but you do it cause you just want to do it to uh, a reward. So you would say, I can't look at my phone until I do th this. So mm -hmm. you actually complete those habit stacks. And then by doing that, then I can go now look at my phone. Mm -hmm. I can I like go, that. you know, look at my social media real quick yeah. or scroll through pointless stuff. Yeah. I don't look at the phone um, because I, I know if I just get out the door and get over to the gym, like, okay, now I'm going to get my workout. 100%. In. Once I'm at the gym, I'm not going to open my phone and get, get in this whole like, you know, digress uh, thing. But like, you know, you open your phone sometimes. It's like you got, like you said, you got texts, emails, all this stuff. There's always problems, fires you got to put out as an entrepreneur. You know this better than me. And, you know, for me, I'm like, I like to attack things right away when I see them or be responsive and stuff like that. So for me, I'm like, let's just, let's just wait, get the workout in. And mm -hmm. then when I get in the office, then I start. Well, yeah, because if you start day. scrolling through your phone and emails, it becomes a barrage of like a hole. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 100% with that. What works best for you in terms of like, the mindset to like go take on something that's maybe you're going to push your comfort zone because we've all mm -hmm. been there. Like, you know, the first time I did my first deal, I was nervous, right? It yeah. was overwhelming. And you know, those smaller deals that I did early on or that condo that you did as your first deal, like that thing doesn't scare you anymore, but you know, I'm sure you're doing stuff now that's like, okay, it's pushing the comfort zone a little bit. What, what kind of techniques work well mindset wise to get you prepared to go take on something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable for a, a period of time? Yeah. So this comes down to personality traits. Um, this is actually a great lead in for somebody that kind of fits this personality. So when I did my disc testing, so that's by Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. uh, I was a CS, right? So C is your hyper analytical, organized, you have a plan for a plan and a plan for that plan, right? So that's great, except you can also get caught up in paralysis by analysis. And then the secondary was the S that was like the yeah. soccer mom. So I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. So I'm analytical and I'm a soccer mom. <laughs> that's not going to work, mm -hmm. which means I'm great with customer service. I'm great with people, but then I avoid risk. I like no change. I like consistency. Don't move. Just keep even, even Steven. Right. Sure. But if you have analytical and organized with don't take any risk and stay steady Eddie, you might as well just go get a cubicle job because you're not going anywhere. Like that's where you need to be. And I was like, well, that's not where I want to go. So I honestly had to start manipulating the second one and I moved the C's there. That's not going to change. But the secondary is now a D. That's the driver director, which means we got to go. We can analyze all we want. We got to get to the edge of the cliff. And we can say we've done all the analysis we can on a deal. We've looked at the risk. We've, you know, call it, uh, I guess, calculated risk. But then you get to the edge of the cliff. You got to go and allow the how to show up. You got to go and allow the how to show up. And it will, especially if you're a go-getter and you're a doer and not a dreamer, the how will show up because mm -hmm. it has to because you'll, get into something and you'd be like, oh crap, it happens all the time and you will find your way through it because you'll just fight, 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 fight. So that has to be in there. And so that D inside of me was the one that made that happen. And once I gained the confidence in going through that once or twice in realizing that every broke person was rich, I'm sorry, I take that back. Every rich person was broke mm -hmm. at some point, right? You can take yeah. everybody, whether it's Grant Cardone, whether it's you know some of the, the billionaires that Elon Musk of the world, they were all broke at some point, right? Jeff Bezos broke in a garage at some point. Mm -hmm. And they just had to push, push, push. They had a dream. They had a vision, but they made it happen. They were a doer, not just a dreamer. Because my dad would always say that. He'd say, listen, there are two types of people in this world. There are doers and there are dreamers. Dreamers, you know, will just dream. But doers, they'll take their dreams and make them a reality. Like, that's so that's good. the difference. Doers will take their dreams and make them a reality. While dreamers will just talk, talk, talk. They dream, dream, dream. They're the ones that say what they're going to do all the time, but that they never execute. And that's typically because of fear. They get to the edge of the cliff and they walk themselves back. Fear the unknown. Yeah, they, they allow, this is another thing I had to learn through psychology, but you have the frontal cortex and then you have this thing called the oblongata or whatever it's called here in the base of your spine. In your human biological brain, when you go towards anything, it automatically wants to stop you and protect you. That's this here. And it's usually bigger than this. So when that's happening, you have to basically say F you to this thing with your frontal cortex mm -hmm. and you got to go. Yeah. And that's usually the difference maker. That's what's gotten you to where you're at. Mm -hmm. That's where Grant Cardone's gotten to. 
I mean, his story in San Diego is incredible. We were chatting about that before we came on, right? Yeah. His first two deals were here in San Diego. You know, he's from Louisiana, did some house flipping and rentals in Houston, moved to San Diego, was living on Camino de la Costa in a house, and this was in the 90s. Ended up walking across the street one day. There was a house that was not even on the market waterfront. He ended up looking over the fence, met a broker that was going to shop this house, and he ended up buying it off market for four million and change, flipped it for nine million and change, and that was his first big chunk of money. Mm. And then he met with a bunch of people here in San Diego. One of them was Rudy Medina, and he was a Marcus and Mila chap at that time. But then he partnered with uh, Rudy. I'm sorry, with uh, Grant on his first two deals. And and one of those two deals was the 37 units in Vista that he, that he talks about. Correct. He had the Vista deal and then Point Loma. Gotcha. And then they did those deals, did well. Um, and then you know uh, Grant ended up going off and doing stuff in Arizona, and then obviously Grant's Grant. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's wild to watch. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. that's crazy. There's a good quote out there that says, if you have all the information to do the deal, you'll never have the deal. And mm -hmm. it's so true. And like everyone has a different level of risk tolerance. Yep. And, um, you know, I used to have a couple partners and one of the, the main reasons I decided to go on my own is because we were just not aligned in terms of level of risk tolerance and having the confidence to, you know, push back, push past certain things. And so I just felt like I was never going to reach my full potential. Yep. Um, working under that that structure. And so, you know, I, I think it's okay for everyone to have a different level of risk tolerance. But, you know, to me, you know, and, and I'm sure for you, like a lot of the stuff that, you know, looking back, a lot of people might think is risky, but, you know, in all reality, you know, as an entrepreneur and as a and real estate investor that's growing, it's like, to me, it's not risky because I know that, you know, when things go south and they will go south with every single deal, that I have the confidence and the team and the resources to, come up with a solution and, yep. and, and push past it. Right. And so there's always going to be unknowns, but you know, and, and it is scary. Right. But I mean, what would you say your biggest fear is? Well, it's funny. Cause like looking back, it was like, you know, that first, my first deal was an 11 unit building in Cincinnati and I cashed out my 401k to get it. And everyone told me it was too risky. You know, I would say my biggest fear looking forward really is, is the fear of regret. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to get yeah, you, to. You, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and you know why? It's because they ask anybody on their deathbed at 80 years old, what mm -hmm. is your greatest thing? And they say, regret that I didn't do this, regret that I didn't do that, regret that this, right? Like my biggest fear is literally myself now meeting my 80 year old self mm. and having to tell that 80 year old self, dude, I'm sorry That's so that, good. I, that I didn't freaking go for it. That's so good. And you hear the quotes all the time. You see them on social media, right? Your, your biggest thing is not going for it. Right, well, I mean, dude, or staying in the same place this year that you were last year, or you know, and that's even if we make it to eighty. Like I just saw, an, I just <laughs> right? saw an article recently that said the uh, life expectancy age for a male in the U.S. has actually dropped from like it was like really? seventy seven. It's dropped from like seventy seven to seventy three. I feel like it's gonna go up. I'm like, with all bro. these weird things we got going on. Yeah, seventy three, man, that's not too far away. But so one in four are getting quick. cancer. I mean, it's it's. I'd be willing to bet you it's, yeah. there's amazing uh, podcasts and there's amazing things on it about the food supply system. Yeah. Well, dude, Justin, I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, yeah. Where can listeners get in touch with you? Uh, go on Instagram, I guess, man. That's probably the yeah. easiest way. If they want to follow it, uh, you just put in Justin C. Brennan and uh, it has all our contact info there and love to be resources for people and, um, you know, just give back as much as we yeah. can. And uh, you're going out to uh, Cancun, is it tomorrow, for Ryan Panetta's uh, mastermind? Yeah, I'm stoked for that. I'm getting on a plane and uh, heading down there tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah, Ryan Panetta's got a uh, kind of a mastermind retreat for the end of the year Love uh, that. that I got into. And we're Love Ryan. Play, play some golf and tell, tell him I say what's up. Chat about some good stuff. So I'm excited. Cool, dude. Uh, well, man, I appreciate you. He's Justin Brennan. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.